2018. Harlan Crumholtz is the Harold H. Hines Jr. Professor of Medicine at uh, Yale University. To mention all his achievements and accolades would take most of the time for the lecture, but suffice to say he was the founding editor of Circulation Cardiovascular Quality and Outcomes. He has published well over a thousand manuscripts and some years ago Forbes magazine described him as the most powerful doctor you have never heard of. Well since then I can tell you most people have heard of Harlan and he has become something of a household name in the United States. In addition, many millions of people have been touched by and benefited from his extraordinary quality improvement initiatives in places such as China and across the globe. Like Paul Wood, he is an inspirational and visionary cardiologist and one of the most influential doctors of his generation. So it is with particular pleasure that on behalf of the British Cardiovascular Society, I now invite Harlan Crumpholtz to get, deliver the 2017 Paul Wood Lecture. Such a lovely introduction, thank you. It's such a lovely introduction. I want to say that I'm very happy to be here with you today in Manchester. Um, I was very touched by the letter that, that Sarah wrote to the membership uh, right after the Manchester Arena bombing, and in particular this that she said as her last sentence, we will all go to Manchester, stand together and support the community in our resolve to defy terrorism and not let, let it win through. The, the immediate reaction was one of stepping forward, not back, and making an assertive positive statement. And I want to say, from the U.S., we speak with great admiration for the resolve of the British not to allow this to turn them to a society that hates, but rather to embrace the strength, the positives, and to seek to keep moving forward and to have a meeting like this and to have every day after the next be better. So I'm inspired by the We Stand Together to celebrate our difference against hatred and intolerance to build a safer and stronger UK, let me say to build a safer and stronger world. And I believe that we as physicians have a special responsibility to be role models around this in the areas of intolerance, in supporting a positive stance toward the way in which society can be as we fight through some of these difficult periods. And I'm proud to be a, a, a physician and caregiver Nurses, all of us together as healthcare professionals, have, I believe, a special role at this time. Not just to tend the sick, but to heal society. So I wanted to tell you about my special connection with uh, the UK. When I graduated from college and before I went to medical school, I had this notion of going around the world and looking at the way in which rural health care was being delivered. I, I, I wasn't like I had a lot of hubris or anything, but I, I had this idea. And they had these traveling fellowships at my college you could apply to and say, and the traveling fellowships were in their name, you could make a proposal of what you wanted to do and then if they found it to be worthy, they would fund you to travel and study something. And so I applied with this idea that I wanted to study the way in which rural health care was delivered in different countries. And I was turned down to the four traveling fellowships, but one of the faculty members took, took mercy on me and thought that it was an interesting idea and was able to scrape up some money, so we created our own traveling fellowship. And the first place that I came was to the UK in 1981. This is 1981 London. And, and I soon discovered the things I loved about the UK. Uh, McVitie's biscuits were the, the, the very best, especially the ones with chocolate on the top. I can't believe how many of those I went through. Uh, free admission to the museums, a, a brilliant idea. And for someone like me without much money, it, it was a godsend. And, uh, and as even I was beginning my fledgling clear, I discovered the British bookstores. In particular, I found myself going to the medical areas and discovering that the most wonderful medical books were from the UK. And particularly, there were these books that had questions in them. I, I don't know if you are, had seen these. That, that There were so many of them, and you could just flip through and test yourself and learn things. I don't know. For me, it was a wonder. But, but the reason I came here was to follow around general practitioners. 
And so believe it or not, what I did was I sent a bunch of letters to general practitioners. I got a list and I sent letters to general practitioners and I said, I I'm a recent graduate. I'm interested in the way in which general practitioners deliver care. Could I come and visit you? I mean, that is just when I think about it now, a wild thing to do. And so many of these general practitioners wrote me back and said, welcome, welcome, you can come. And it took me all around the, the country and as far away as, uh, anyone know where this is? This is Tarbert in Isle of Harris. So I, I, was, I was going around, and people would welcome me, and I would sit across from them in their, uh, and watch them deliver care. And uh, just to prove to you I was actually there, that's not photoshopped in. And, <laughs> and this is on the Isle of Harris, actually. And, and I fell in love with British physicians. I, the way in which they cared for the patients, the way in which they listened. At that time, they had these little sort of almost cardboard cards that had, because these each had like two or 3,000 people that they were taking care of, and they could flip through the deck, and they knew them each very personally and were caring for them in ways that were also not just medical, but, but sociological. I mean, they were a fabric of the community. And it taught me so much about what it meant to be a committed physician and what that physician could mean for a community and what the physician could mean for the the patient and the dignity of the profession. I mean, it, it, there wasn't a person I met that that didn't come through to me uh, so clearly. So it, it always gave me, a, it was a four and a half months that I, I spent here going around the country and on those visits and it's something which has stuck with me my, my entire life. Uh, I also had a mentor, Kenny Chatterjee, who trained at St. George's, and uh, he was the um, epitome of a British physician. Calm, thoughtful, precise, with the most extraordinary physical examination skills you could ever imagine, and the most incisive, incisive memory, and the ability to put together a case in a way that you, you, it was magic. And uh, it, we always knew that Chatterjee had acquired these skills while in the UK. And he would talk fondly of it. And I just at least wanted to honor him also. He passed away recently, but was a giant in the US and a gift from the UK, uh, really born in Calcutta, uh, Calcutta at that time. I, I put this up here because I'm going to go back to it. This is what Chatterjee's notes would look like. And we would always take it for granted that that was the gold standard. I, I, I swear, this is almost like an exact replica of a Chatterjee note on the physical examination. And we always wondered sort of where, where did that come from? So I want to come down to Paul Wood for, for a second, because Paul Wood, I'm honored to be the Paul Wood lecturer. This is a special honor uh, as I learned more about him. But I realized that he was the original data scientist. So when John Cam uh, uh, wrote up a piece about uh, Wood, he said this was his application to become a cardiologist. He wrote this piece. I have a scheme. The open sesame to success in London is in the bowels of the hospital, in the storeroom. All those old notes of all the old patients with x-rays and electrocardiograms, these notes are a gold mine. They ought to be analyzed. It would be a three-year job. I shall know more about hearts than most people. I shall be a heart specialist. I love hearts. <laughs> I don't know about the last. That's amazing. But but you'll see the connection to what I'm going to talk about today. The notion that in our everyday experience lies the fuel for evidence generation that has, even today, not as tapped as it should be, and, and lies the secrets that we need in order to care for each one of our patients. And I thought it was interesting that, that Wood would say that. Th these are some of the notes that were in that article and, and others. Uh, actually, in the first Paul Wood lecture, a lot of these were shown and um, in tribute to him, but just to show how data-oriented he was. But there's also, if you notice here, this is actually Paul Wood's note on the physical examination that I put by Chatterjee's, because I, I, I swear they're exact replicas. And uh, I thought, well, this is just a lineage, because people were taught to listen carefully, to take that kind of note, to be precise, not just as they do in the States, say, you know, no murmurs heard, or there's worse that we do. You know, we, we're, we don't discipline ourselves to say, what exactly did you hear and where? And uh, yet, this is, seems like Paul Wood was done in through, uh, through Chatterjee. So, the, the, I know that was an extended preface, but this is a, a distinct honor for me to be here, and I wanted to share some of those thoughts with you. So, here's the problem I want to pose to you. I believe that the current medical research enterprise cannot keep pace with the information needs 
of patients, clinicians, administrators, and policymakers. Every day we're confronted with settings for which the data that do exist are, are not directly relevant. They do not inform us. They put us in a position of speculating to a great extent. And we have a wide variety of opinions about what the right thing to do is and a paucity of evidence to support us in our beliefs. Any survey of the guidelines will show you that most of the, even the guideline recommendations still end up being expert opinion. And yet our capabilities continue to expand every day and we're left in the dark on most of the things that, that we have to do. I assert to you that medicine now more than ever is an information science and we need to start thinking of it that way. And increasingly it will be a digital information science. It's providing the accelerant that we need in order to get in a position where we can truly harvest systematically the kind of information that that Wood would have had to go to the basement in the bowels of the hospital and spend three years searching for, we will now be able to do in a flash of an instant, be able to have access to that. The question is, will we be wise enough to learn from it? And will we be able to integrate in an approach that makes us better than we were before? Because it's going to be data to analysis to application, but here's where the outcomes research question gets raised. Are we better off? More data, even more evidence, may not necessarily put us in a better position. It's going to be up to us to iterate to determine, at the end of the day, are our patients doing better because of what we're, what we're trying to produce? Is the, this new age actually helping us be better doctors? Is it helping our patients achieve better outcomes? Because like anything, this era has the potential for unintended adverse consequences like any other era. So it's going to be about whether we are smart enough to proceed. So I've been writing a bit about this, uh, and you're welcome to read some of the things. You know, big data and the new knowledge in medicine, the thinking, training, and tools needed for learning healthcare system. I see this very closely connected with the idea that research isn't over here and clinical care over here, like it has been historically, where the researchers are working here with their own value system and rewards, building up some edifice to generate some knowledge around patients that aren't exactly relevant to the ones over here in the clinical world and the clinicians poo-pooing a lot of that work that's going on there because they're saying you don't know what my life is like you don't know what my patients look like you don't know what it's like to make the complex decisions that I'm faced with every day and this beautiful pristine thing you're producing over here doesn't seem entirely relevant to what I'm doing here and then they build it and we dismantle it and we build it again and it's a grant competition and it's a publication competition and we all get promoted but the, over here in the real world there's often a big disconnect and what's going to happen is a coming together of the work to generate knowledge in the everyday operation of the healthcare system integrating the perspectives of the people who are delivering care with people who can do the research and, and getting away from this split and polarization so you know, I'm talking about data acquisition, curation, and use for continuously learning healthcare system. It's always going to be the question, for what use? For what purpose? How will it be applied? How will we know that it's better as a result? It's never just about the top line, data acquisition, curation, and use. No. For what reason? That's what we're going to know. Promise of it. Opportunities and challenges. So it starts with an idea of there's no average patient. I mean, these are some of the, the, the steps on my path around this, which is, well, let me get this straight. We'll spend 10 years and $100 million doing a study, and everybody waits with bated breath to go to the big meeting for the late-breaking clinical trial to find out an average result. And that average result fits this person. So it, it's perfect for this person. But you know, this picture is a composite of all these people. So you tell me which person does that middle person actually look like? Whose experience does that person in the middle, who isn't a person, is just a composite, actually reflect? And when we enroll 20, 30,000 people, do you believe that there's not substantial heterogeneity above that? I believe it's impo implausible for the vast majority of these studies for there not to be meaningful heterogeneity and experience among the people who are in that trial. Do we believe that the response of everyone in that trial exactly replicates what that average is? Does it make any sense that that would be true? And then when we want to get precise, what we say is, well, we're going to accept the average relative reduction in risk, but let's look at the absolute risk so we can tell, you know, what the number needed to treat is, and that's how we personalize this. But it can't be true that everyone has the same response. 
There must be differences, but how are we going to begin to understand that? Nobody, let alone the people who get into the clinical trials, are, are not people who are highly complex, difficult, and for which there's any even diagnostic uncertainty. So in that scenario, you're excluding, it's not even that there's heterogeneity within the trial, there's heterogeneity in the people who you're seeing every day, who you know never would have gotten into that trial for a wide variety of reasons. And as our population of patients becomes older, that becomes even a more uh, threatening situation because the heterogeneity in the elderly is so great and so few of the trials are actually enrolling people of older age. So let me tell you about some other things that are on my mind about what we need to improve in medicine. So prediction's pretty important. And I'm personally interested in prediction and response to therapy. I think we need to be equipped with better information about prognosis. We need to know better what's the heterogeneity in response. But on the prediction side, I started thinking about how we approach this. So predicting at one year. You know, what we do is we take a time zero at the beginning. We start at the beginning, we get a bunch of baseline variables, and then we predict out for the year. And we, we get, you know, we, we're able to perform at a certain level, but it's sort of assumes that everything just starts at that beginning and that we don't know anything subsequently. And the importance of those predictors stay the same the entire year. I mean, it's, it, we don't start looking at, well, by the way, who predicts it a year? I mean, you see somebody usually less than a year. I mean, wh where is this all taking us and how are we updating over time and how is it helping us learn? Um, but we just start simply baseline and predict out. This dynamic idea is, how do we, when we do update, we tend to start over. So you've got a risk equation and now they come in again and we do another assay, but we don't pay any attention to what happened before. And we don't update and say, when this happens, that we need to be able to be thinking in more complex ways than just an initial measurement at baseline. And, um, and then also when we predict these composite endpoints, we pretend like the predictors are the same for all components of the endpoint. So what I what we discovered about MACE is it's convenient that you can increase the number of endpoints in a trial, but you know that, that, for example, blood pressure has a very different relationship with CAD than it does with stroke. So once you start combining all these things together, the predictors are different, the relationship between the thing you're modifying is different, and you, we end up, the point is we end up simplifying beyond common sense. And be, as a result, we're left with less information than we would have otherwise. I talk about this, this my team hears me talk about this all the time, I swear I'm going to solve this. I said, predicting anything, are we making the most of the past history and are we losing valuable information with yes, no predictors? And to what extent are we taking advantage of what I say, the music before predicting the music after? So I say a patient comes in and they've lived their life, and then we do something like say yes, no, heart failure, yes, no, hypertension, yes, no, diabetes, as we start to build our risk predictors. We have a very complex history that people have come in with, and we simplify it beyond recognition, and then we try to say that that helps us understand a heterogeneous population. And by the way, the music after is, this is my point about being predicting different things, there's different, it's not just yes, no, die, or yes, no, hospitalized. There's a pattern that exists afterwards. Now, this may sound like magical thinking, but do you think that when the big tech companies are trying to predict that they're just trying to basically take your whole past history of, of what you've purchased and just say yes, no, bought shoes, you know, yes, no, bought a hat, you know, do you think that they somehow are capable of taking into account the high dimensional complex information about your behavior? And do you think they just predict forward, yes, likely to buy a hat? No, they know what size, play, when, where. Amazon has an algorithm that says they can start shipping before you buy it because they know so well what you're going to buy. So when I'm telling you music before, music after, understand the patterns, I'm just trying to get us where Amazon was maybe five years ago, if not a decade ago. I'm saying it's time for medicine to wake up and say, we are in a new era. To what extent are we leveraging this era for the future of the profession? And it ought to be us, healthcare professionals, doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals, who are guiding that evolution not large corporations 
or groups that are managing large amounts of data who are just going to be dictating what should be done. It has to be the people who know what it's like to sit across the bedside from a patient who understand the fear, the anxiety, the uncertainty, the issues that make medicine a great profession. You know the greatest thing about medicine? It's that someone walks in who doesn't know you when this happens and trusts you because you're a doctor and you get to show them that that was a good decision by showing that you're worthy of that trust, that you only have their interests on your mind, that you only want to do the best for them. And they didn't even know you before. But because you're a doctor or nurse, they assume that that's what your motivation is. And then you show them it's true. Then you reveal to them that it's true. That's, that's a, and, and that's why people in this room need to be involved in making sure that this next generation, which has enormous capabilities, is deployed in a way that always maintains that special nature of being a physician and nurse and healthcare professional. The other thing that bothers me about the prediction is we don't take it into account when the confluence of events occur. We all know as healthcare professionals that when three things occur at once that can be a harbinger of a terrible outcome, it's very different than if they occur individually. But when we're doing our analyses, we rarely are really taking this into account. And you know that there must be many situations. I, I put up here the enzyme. It's like, you know, you can reduce the activation energy for problems when more than one thing exists together. That analogy of it's not just singularly adding to risk, but that there are certain toxic actors that when they occur together, put people at particular, you know, particular risk of harm. How are we incorporating that and understanding that? And then I love this one. So this is someone's partner and they're, they're looking at the pregnancy test and the pregnancy test is great. It's perfect. The sensitivity and specificity is so high and it's telling them she's pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I put this up here because we have to be smart enough to know when are we spending a lot of time trying to learn something that we already know that's so obvious? And I also say, or when we're getting false precision. When the difference between 1%, 2%, 3% still like about the same, and all of a sudden I can tell you, no, it's 1.1% instead of 1.3%. I mean, we have to know where it matters and where it doesn't. Where does the information give us marginal benefit? Where's the value of that information in decision making? That's where we need to invest. It's no use to invest in, in more precision when that doesn't help you or when you already know the answer. And in fact, uh, this is one of the problems. I mean, it's insulting. Have you seen decision support tools that tell you to do something that is it's just mind-numbingly insulting because it, you, know, you feel that anyone should know this already and, and that they have to have a decision support tool to tell me that is insulting? I mean, the question is sort of where is that leverage point where we can help us be better like athletes, what can we take advantage of the latest technology to make us perform better, but not tell us things that are obvious? So one of our challenges is about communicating this high complex data. So in, in the US, maybe you have to the Weather Channel, you know, is a very popular thing. So one of the things I hear from people is, I'm overwhelmed by information. You know, it's got to be kept simple. Tim, well, first of all, you all, you know, are healthcare professionals. You are at a certain level of education, but, but Who's thought about how we're presenting information to each other? How have we honed this skill? So, you know that this, by the way, is very high dimensional information. This is information that's tracking from, I don't know, maybe a million sensors of all sorts of different types, very sophisticated, and high level algorithms are being applied. Now, I don't know how many classes you went to in order to be able to read this because I want to tell you this is sophisticated stuff. And when you, when you look at this stuff, you see nobody had to go to one single class. Nobody even had, there's not even a legend on this table to tell you what this means. There's not even anything that explains this. Now, I, I, I know this is a silly thing, but you, you start looking at this and you say, there's a lot here. I mean, it's a, but, how long does it take you to look at this and realize what it means? A half a second? I mean, 
Somebody spent time saying, how do we take high dimensional information that's being collated and curated from a high number of, sen of sensors that is going through sophisticated, detailed algorithms, and then be able to put out so there's not one person, regardless of their education level, in the US, in the world, who wouldn't immediately know what this means. And uh, that's remarkable. But what are we doing this in medicine? I mean, we almost bend over backwards to make our any of our visualizations complicated. Actually, look at Paul Wood's stuff. Very simple, clear. Most people could look at it immediately and know what it meant. There was no annotation there. When they, when they come out with this new technology, I mean, we had to spend weeks on epic implementation. We had to go to these classes that were all day. I mean, people were telling us, who went to the class on the iPhone or the Android? I mean, how many, how many hours did you put in? Who's certified here in iPhone? <laughs> I mean, the, it's time for us to start thinking about the user experience and the user interface and how we're making our jobs easier. It's easier for us to excel. Not that there's a big bar so that you have to sit in classes, you have to be trained so much, people have to audit you and overlook you. They should be making you better, stronger, faster, smarter. We should be embracing the technology, but it's got to be the technology that's going to help us. And you know, even, even for this, I thought, well, here they're just showing confidence intervals or uncertainty. They're showing you a hurricane path. Again, you didn't have to go to a class to see that the farther out you get from today, the wider the cone of where the hurricane's going to go. Again, there's no explanation here. Everybody knows what it means. It's because there's been time spent in saying, we can make it easy to interpret data that's high dimensional, complex, coming from multiple sensors, running through all many algorithms, but we can make the end user see something that they can immediately understand and, and a process. Now, I, I couldn't resist showing this one because it's the same thing with driving. So you know that uh, in order to pick up information on traffic, Thousands of sensors. I mean, I used to think it was just the phone. I really, I started studying this. It's amazing the number of sensors that are watching the, the traffic. Now, detailed information, highly complex, large amounts of algorithms, a lot of uncertainty. All this stuff is going on at one time now. I know the general public will never figure this out. So we probably ought to get experts in so they can tell people things or I, I don't know what, how we're going to do this. Well, I don't know who was trained on this map, but this, anyone certified in this? You know, it's like it was just made to be intuitive. So that you, all of that back end stuff was going on, but it made it so we could make intelligent choices about driving. We knew what, how long it's going to take. We knew where there's a traffic jam. They're using colors. Nobody had to say, no one has a legend here what green means. Nobody has a legend here what red means. Like, I don't know who taught that. I mean, just for some reason, everyone knows it. Because somebody invested in the idea that we got to make information accessible and easily usable. Now, one of the keys is going to be for us getting data. And the central premise is the same one that Wood had. The data generated every day for a variety of practical purposes could serve as an inexhaustible source of knowledge to fuel a learning healthcare system. This is where we need to be. Where it's not that all of the experiences that you're having every day with your patients are lost on everyone but you. You're the one with the broad breadth of experience, but you're in, in a poor position to make sure that either the people that follow you or your colleagues or anyone else can leverage the wisdom from the experience that you've had and that the patients have had. This is the tragedy of what we've just been through, which is we've been through eras and eras where the wise doctor was the one with a lot of experience, but there was no way for that person, except through lectures and textbooks and articles, to be part of a knowledge generation uh, hive that could accelerate what we knew. Now, meanwhile, what's going on in the world? This is I found to be amazing. I mean, I'm just saying data is everywhere, right? Data is being generated. This is the time spent per adult user per day with digital media in the U.S. You see that 5.6 hours, of which 3.1s on a mobile device, mostly the phone, 2.2 on desktop and other connected devices. This is mind blowing. This is. 
People are using these digital computers in ways that we never envisioned. They're spending a lot of time interacting with them. If medicine wants to get with it, we're going to figure out how to leverage this because people have left us behind. We want to live in an analog universe, we're going to be living by ourselves. We want to get on the digital uh, revolution and leverage the ways in which we're going to be able to deliver care, to be able to talk to patients, to be able to understand what's going on in their life, to be able to deliver uh, information. It's, you, you can hold back if you want, but I'm telling you, it's 5.6 hours in the U.S. I mean, who has 5.6 hours to spend on digital devices? The average American. I know, there's, there's, but imagine what that curve looks like. There's some people who are at zero, so some people are spending a hell of a lot more time on their digital devices. Smartphone adoption, uh, even among seniors, has nearly quadrupled in the last five years. All adults, you're at 90%. But even among seniors, you're at 67%. Two-thirds have smartphones. And over time, everyone's going to be having access to these digital devices. And this, this headline was, tech use is especially limited among those age 75 and up. Really? The limited was, for those 75 to 79, 60% use the internet. For those 80 and older, 44% are using the internet. Own a smartphone, you're still at 31% for 75 to 79 year olds. And you're at 17% for 80 year olds. And as time moves on, and the ones who are 65 start getting into the older age group. I mean, you, you know where this is going. We know where this is going. So the question is, are we as a profession going to be able to, to leverage that movement? How about this intercom conversation started global? You know when you call these companies and you have this sort of intercom thing where people are asking questions and, you know, hi, Jennifer, they're asking something, somebody, it worked, thanks. And she's going, yes, great. I mean, we are afraid of this in medicine. We're afraid for the ability to rapidly communicate, answer questions, get people's problems solved like this. By the way, in the U.S., we hardly have the financial incentive to do this. I mean, in the U.K., there's, there are more incentives, but who's going to solve this problem where we can figure out when someone's got a question that can be answered like this, that we can find places to meet the patients where they are so they don't have to come where we are. I can tell you that decentralization is one of the mega trends in medicine. How are we being smart enough to do that? I, I, I'm, I'll get to something more about it. I don't know if you know about this Peloton thing. So people are buying these bikes and they're getting a TV screen in front of them who's, in, who's individually coaching a class of people who are distributed. But in their home, they're part of a virtual class. Not only that, the Peloton machine is collecting information about their exercise, their duration, their speed, their strength. How much do you have to jump to start thinking about what this application might be for cardiac rehab? Or a wide variety of other applications. How do we drive down the price? This is an expensive uh, device at this point. But, but where, I'm just trying to stimulate, where are we going with this? How are we going to meet people where they are? How are we going to leverage this? The amount of information that this would generate that could be available at a clinic visit or a virtual clinic visit that would help you understand the progress somebody is making uh, could be astounding. AI voice activated home assistants. You don't think that this isn't going to be a big trend where now even older people are going to be able to ask questions, get input data. In other words, be asked questions about their functions and symptoms. The Google machine learning word accuracy is just about the same as humans at this point. And so, we're in a different phase. People are no longer needing to type. Actually, 70% of the requests made to the Google Assistant are, are conversational language now. People talk into their phone and ask a question. And then it either does a Google search or you can ask Siri or, or any of the other voice assistants on your mobile device. This, again, is where the world is going. The question is, what are we doing? to ensure that within medicine it's safe, it's appropriate, it's, it's in people's interest. How are we integrating it into practice? In the U.S., doctors are largely demoralized. Why? Because they've become drones and clerks, slaves of the electronic health record. Instead of taking charge, standing up and envisioning what the future of the profession should be, and being part of the excitement of reinventing the way in which the entire infrastructure should be constructed. What is an office visit after all? What are we really trying to accomplish? 
How are we leveraging this information and meeting people where they are? The Echo, by the way, already in this short period of time, it is, has a great adoption, so the others. Wearable sensors are another thing, which, you know, there were these articles in there saying that they can commonly uh, be misleading, but the question is, are they directionally correct? How much precision do you need? Do I need to know exactly how many steps somebody took, or do I need to know that they're walking? I mean, it's up to us to kind of be able to sort of say, when can the less expensive strategy get us the information that's good enough for us to be able to have a conversation with patients in ways that we haven't been able to do before? And this is only going to expand. The number of devices, patches, tattoos, all sorts of things. And we're going to need to decide where is it just frivolous and where is it critically important information that helps us change our minds about what needs to go on. And similarly, you're going to see new devices, ultrasound devices that are going to go to phones. But the mother load is the electronic health record. And in the U.S., something amazing happened when we put $50 billion on the table as incentive for hospitals to convert from analog paper into an electronic health record. A funny thing happened. They all did. They all did. And what we did stupidly in the U.S. was we didn't, we clinicians didn't hold hands and say, we want to set the rules. Great, U.S., you want to distribute $50 billion to get to full integration? Because look, in 2009, 2008, only 10% have a basic EHR. 2015, 83% have basic. We're, we're almost now full penetration in any major center has got an electronic health record. But we clinicians didn't exert ourselves and say, but here are the rules. In order for anyone to get paid, you've got to have X, Y, and Z that protects the interests of patients and is usable. It doesn't mean that our eyes have to be typing all the time. I mean, we, we lost an opportunity that we should not lose again. But this has created great opportunities. And these, this is an article appeared in the New England Journal from our government, lots of people, a lot of government agencies, talking about transforming evidence generation to support health and healthcare decisions that was leveraging this whole idea. And, and also the idea that patients can have control of their healthcare record. I'll, I'll, I'll go on. So, in, in concert with this, is largely a concern that people's healthcare records will be used for nefarious purposes. And so that we tend to tighten up the restrictions on who gets to use them. But the truth is, patients should have access to their own records. And then we should try to figure out how we can be worthy of having them share them with us to generate knowledge and improve their care. People like Sharon Terry, one of my heroes, um, a mom whose children were affected by a genetic condition, who formed a community that eventually led to the identification of a target and a drug treating that condition, is a true citizen scientist. That doesn't mean she's the scientist part, but she was able to assemble the people who work with the scientists and to make this happen. She wrote this piece that participants Participants in studies want not only be invited to the table, but also to design and host the meal with other stakeholders. They want to assert themselves. They want to be able to have access to their data. The Precision Medicine Initiative in the U.S., now called All of Us, and the National Cancer Data Ecosystem for Sharing Analysis, for Sharing and Analysis, this is Joe Biden's initiative, two large, well-funded national efforts were all predicated on the idea that we can get this digital data electronic records, share it with people, and those people, if they decide to, could share it with the researchers. And Sue Desmond, uh, my chief resident when I was an intern and now head of Gates Foundation, when she wrote about this, she said, I believe the most important requirement for new knowledge network envisioned by precision medicine is that it be driven by patients. I put up this quote because a lot of people were waving their hands saying this is the end of disease. Like you guys in the UK Biobank, you have 500,000. The US was wanting to have a million. They said, you know, this is going to be amazing. We're going to have all this information. Sue, I think rightly said, you know what's revolutionary about this? You're trying to build a research platform with people as participants, and you're trying to make use of the digital data that they have access to, or can, should have access to, and, and treat them as partners. 
people writing this, for the benefit of digital medicine be fully realized, we need not only find a shared home for personal health data, but also give individuals the right to own them. Someone else, this is a unique moment where we may be able to provide for personal control and at the same time create a global knowledge medical resource. This is another trend that's occurring. The digitalization of data, who owns it? Everyone nervous about it. People can own it. People can have it. And then we can be worthy of being partners with them in sharing it. In the U.S., patients' rights are well levered. Uh, we can leverage well-established principle that an individual should have access rights to data and information in his or her health record. We can fight about who actually owns it. I said the word own. But in the U.S., what we've said is we're not sure who owns it. But we sure as heck are sure about who should have access to it, the person. And then that's, that's this part of this revolution that's, that's moving forward. In full disclosure, I've been working on a platform to help people aggregate their data from different sources. I believe that the central thing that was holding this back was the ability for people to pull data of different sources and different formats and different standards into one secure cloud-based account. And then what we said was, in this repository, no data would move without your permission. You could get off the platform if you wanted to. And it's up to you if you want to share. Totally up to you. But that this could aggregate the data from any, any different place. So you can link with health systems, you can get a timeline of your healthcare record, and you can enter and share with research stuff. And then we also put into this, again, full disclosure, this is something I'm working on, but other people should come and join and work on this too. A new way to communicate by pinging people with questions. This says, Please indicate your level of stress you're experiencing today. But you could ask them about angina or function. In addition to being able to pull in data from how far they walked or what did they do, we can create dashboards. So when we do communicate with people, we're recognizing that the clinical encounter is a very small percentage of their life experience. And we need to be able to understand what their life is like if we want to truly leverage this new era. So we're trying to, to make it so this can be secure. It's encrypted in motion and at rest. It's, it's protected. But we're finding new ways to rapidly communicate with people so that we can learn about what's going on. Again, what's this new era going to look like? How are you going to be equipped with the information when you talk to patients? How are we going to be able to make choices that are wise? This is an article that came out yesterday in JAMA from ASCO in which they looked at a trial and they saw that Actually collecting this information about patients' symptoms and experience was associated with longer survival times. And the point here was that the doctors were in tune with information that they wouldn't have known otherwise. And, but this is the first study that would suggest that collecting this kind of information can produce that kind of benefit. So I just want to go through a couple other things. Prescriptive analysis, what's best for you? This is about saying when we're trying to figure out how to make a best blouse, we're collecting all sorts of different information. We're also, when people are selecting, we're helping people understand what they might value and what they don't. We're not even doing this in medicine. A lot of our clinical strategies, I say, we're leaving a time when we assume medicine's deterministic, mechanistic, and dichotomous, yes, no, to a period where we're recognizing it's continuous. It's stochastic and probabilistic. We don't often know when we do something what's going to happen. It's increasing or decreasing the risk. How are we preparing people to understand this uncertainty and this probabilistic approach rather than deterministic? When I was taught in the wards, it was usually this is because of that. We have to load reduce and then people's cardiac output increases and they feel better. But then actually if you look at the ACE inhibitor trials, there's no evidence anyone feels better on ACE inhibitors. There's not. The trials that collected that information, they, didn't, they lived longer, but they didn't find that they, they did that. What do we do about antihypertensives? It's crazy. We try to put people in these boxes when that doesn't make any sense. I mean, is this really how simple it is and we should just put people in boxes and that's how decisions should be made and there's no heterogeneity among these boxes? I mean, people will look back on us and laugh that this is what we were doing for guidelines and then trying to test quality by whether or not you got people in the right boxes without regard to actually what their preferences and values and goals were, let alone what heterogeneity might be with regard to their responses. This is the one that drives me the most crazy. It's a Chad's VAST score. So we're going to give you one point for congestive heart failure. I don't care what kind of congestive heart failure you're I don't care how long you had, I don't care how severe it is. You're getting a point. 
I'm giving you a point for hypertension. I don't care if it's treated or untreated. I don't care if it's severe. I don't care if you were hospitalized last week for it. You're getting a point. And diabetes, same thing. I don't care if you're on insulin, not on insulin. You're diet controlled. You, you, you used to have diabetes. You had diabetes. You're getting a point. And, and not only that, if you're a woman, you're getting a point. <laughs> you know, because all women are higher risk. All of them deserve a point. There's no difference among women. They're all a point. And I mean, and, and also it assumes that being at high risk for some set of these characteristics is the same as being high risk for some of the others. I mean, is it plausible that being high risk because you're elderly is different than being high risk because you're 40 and have like three of these? I mean, what kind of heterogeneity is it likely to be? And all we do is like, well, we need a quality indicator. If you had a high, if Chad's Vask and you weren't, I mean, th this doesn't, we can do better than this. We can do a lot better than this. And, and computational phenotyping, I mean, you know when we look to animals, we actually try to make distinctions. And, but you know how many types of heart failure or diabetes are? These are some diffusion maps we're making of characteristics of patients. Every dot's a patient. We're trying to look at, in high dimensional ways to understand this. But two types of diabetes, or I think most of the heart failure with preserved systolic function are failures because we're mixing a lot of heterogeneous patients together who have different mechanisms underlying pathophysiology and when you mush them all together and you give them a single treatment we can't figure out who the responders are. There's likely to be responders somewhere but the trials fail because we've just mixed a bunch of people. Some probably don't even have heart failure and, and because of our inclusion criteria. And th these are just ways we're trying to use some of this high dimensional mapping, but they, in the end it's about we're looking at this. But the truth is it looks like something like this. Because we've created labels a hundred years ago that we cling to as a way to help us understand underlying pathophysiology and, ris and risk and response. But we ought to let go of them because they're not really serving us well because the labels we have still have such underlying heterogeneity that when we're seeing people in practice they just don't quite fit. They, they fit okay, but not great. And, and where are we going to start moving forward with actually classifications that, that make sense? And now we've got the computer power to do it. And, you know, I say, Coastal said, technology replace 80% of what doctors do. There's a lot of 80%, there's 80% of what doctors do that I wish technology would take over. Because we, we want to do the fun stuff, the smart stuff that really taps our training. And we want to get rid of all the reflexive stuff. I will tell you one thing. You guys got, got this deep mind health. I can't wait to see what this thing... You gave all your data over to Google. They better do something good with it since you did it. But I'm curious about that. Um, you know about this, right? Everybody knows about this. Who voted for that? <laughs> Maybe they'll do something good. But, it, but, you know, we're also vectorizing the lots of comp, high dimensional computational data. But I like this one. This is the best use of this stuff. These convolutional neural nets can actually do as well as a dermatologist for diagnosing melanoma. Why wouldn't we want to use this if it takes everybody can essentially get the same assessment as the world's leading dermatologist? This is where we have to run to say, like, we shouldn't be afraid of this. It's not threatening to us. If actually we can use this for visual images, then we should take advantage of it. Just like ultimately for us with heart sounds. It may be that we have an algorithm that helps process the information from the sounds in the chest and it will no longer be that the very best cardiologist had the very best ears for most of their life and could hear things that nobody else could hear. We shouldn't be afraid when it will help make us better. There's plenty of stuff for us to do. We need to be the guide for the patient. We need to be able to provide and help them with judgment, align the preferences, values and goals. We need to be do things that no machine will ever do. But to the degree to which it can help us, we should embrace it. And, and we've been working on this too with analysis of machine learning techniques for heart failure readmissions. We think we can improve a lot of the predictions. The question is, does it matter in the end? So right now we're still in the early R&D to see can you improve it? But similarly we're asking how much better is it and does it make a difference? My last thing is how many doctors take to change the light bulb? I, I tried to look up on Google to see if there was any funny response to this. Uh, they were mostly lame. But, but I will tell you another piece of it is how many patients can a cardiologist take care of? In the UK you guys are much better at this than we are in the US. But we should all know what's the optimal number. And I think that whatever it is, it's probably we can 10x it. 
Because if we take into account our team members, technology, the cardiologist should be reserved for the challenging, difficult cases where strategy needs to be set or a difficult diagnosis needs to be made. But we can probably routinize a lot of the work that's being done and we can work as teams and we can be smarter than we've ever been about being able to take care of larger populations. And we can concentrate our efforts where we uniquely can make a contribution. And I think technology will bring us there. So it's always going to be important uh, to care. And of course, this doctor was limited in what he could do for this patient. But, but this is not, none of what I've said is to suggest that the essential nature of being a healthcare professional, a clinician, will change. It's just a question of how it will evolve as the tools make us stronger and better and as we assert ourselves to make sure that they're not used in ways that are likely to harm or undermine the patients. So the, the idea of the, the old doctor, the, the, the ability to connect with patients, all of that uh, will continue to, to stay the same. And I say in this knowledge generation that we're talking about communities of people empowered with their data assets, partnering in knowledge generation, producing a healthier future. This is how I see it coming together. And I say communities, not cohorts. They're not cohorts. We're not just extracting data from them. They're in partnership with us as, our, as patients and as participants in knowledge generation. Participants and partners, not subjects. Frictionless digital real-time data flow, not episodic brute force data collection. Rapid A-B testing, which I didn't talk a lot about, but I see as a new way of adaptive trials. Rapid A-B testing, not large, cumbersome clinical trials. Modern technology-enabled research, not clunky, outdated techniques. It's time to start thinking about not just following the way we've always done it, but to say what is likely to be the best way going forward. For a lot of the, those of you who are trainees and just starting in cardiology, I say there's never been a more exciting time to be part of this field. And you've got to help us be part of its positive evolution. One more thing just to go back to my beginning part. So it is a special honor to be in Manchester. I, after that happened, I, I, I felt even more honored to be here with you, asserting positively that we're going to work together for the greater good. And I pull out these two Martin Luther King quotes, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And that's what you do every day as healthcare professionals and clinicians. And it's that light that we need as much of as we can get. And the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. We have to retain an optimism that society will continue to improve. It just not, may not be in a straight line. Thank you very much.